So what I'm here to talk about today is, um, is deployment at scale, um, specifically around the IBM Cloud Container Service. Um, so a small plug about myself is uh, I've been with IBM for 22 years. I started off doing uh, SAP deployments within IBM before virtualization and before, you know, we're still running like token ring, I think, at the time. And that's how long ago it was. And I actually moved from services to doing product development. So we were actually building products, you know, putting them on a CD and mailing them out to customers. Uh, and then for about the past three years, I've been doing cloud development. Um, so basically running, learning what cloud, uh, cloud native applications are, what running a service means. Um, so we've actually kind of had this journey with an IBM overall, kind of learning how to do this stuff. Um, and what we're going to talk about tonight is kind of where we're at today with the IBM Cloud Container Service. Um, and one of the reasons I put this little arrow in here is when I did all my <coughs> initial work doing SAP deployments, I'm finding a lot of parallels kind of building and running and managing the SAP service to even actually running a cloud service today. Um, some of the lessons learned that we uh, took back 20 years ago are still applicable today. So that's kind of stuff we'll get into as well. Uh, and now the plug for the IBM Cloud Container Service. Uh, essentially, it's hosted Kubernetes. So if uh, you go to ibmcloud.com and you say, I want a new Kubernetes cluster, uh, you sign up, um, uh, say, create me a cluster, give some specifications. So we do um, standard um, Kubernetes clusters using virtual, virtual machines, or you can even do bare metal boxes. Um, we do all the, we, we, we set, the, set the clusters up, we manage them, sure they're secure, all that kind of good stuff. So we are, I'm going to talk about something called RASI, and I'm pronouncing that wrong on purpose because I don't know how to say it the right way. And if, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you'll realize that everything has this kind of nautical naming to it. And so there's actually a Wikipedia page that talks about, it's just a list of nautical terms. So if, once you get into Kubernetes, you, what you'll find, you'll go to this wiki page, and you'll see, OK, this kind of matches what I'm doing. And that's what we do with Razi. So Razi is actually a boat or a ship that has been decommissioned. Um, and they've actually scraped some layers off the boat, like a couple uh, uh, decks off the boat, to make it uh, smaller and nimbler. So there's a little bit of meaning behind the Razi. Uh, and that's what we came up with. And the, also, the internal code name for IBM Cloud Container Service is Armada. And the reason I bring this up is I'm going to start talking about Armada and Razi throughout the presentation here, just making sure that uh, kind of the history around what it means. So the scaling of Armada. So I started this job about a year ago. Um, at that time, we had one data center uh, in Dallas that we ran the entire IBM Cloud Container Service out of. Um, and now we're running in. 29 data centers um, in 15 regions. So Dallas, we have about four different data centers just in Dallas. Um, we have them spread up across the world. I think the only place we're not in yet is Africa and Antarctica, um, hopefully coming soon. So I don't know about Antarctica, but. <laughs> um, so this is kind of gives the idea of the scale uh, of, of our application itself. So the architecture of Armada is for every one of those regions, every single one of those 15 regions, we have uh, what we call hubs and spokes. Um, so our hub, um, and one of the things that I want to mention is that we basically manage Kubernetes with Kubernetes. So our whole control plane is Kubernetes, and everything that we deploy are Kubernetes clusters. So we have hubs. Once we run out of capacity to manage a specific amount of clusters, we will um, spin up another spoke, and that spoke can then be used to manage additional clusters uh, in that particular region. We also have, uh, so our Customers' clusters, we call those cruisers. And we have something called patrols, which when you go to IBM Cloud, you can say, hey, I would like to try this out, and you get a free cluster. And so we actually manage those in a different, um, a slightly different data center. We do the rest of them. So some of the challenges that we have. So we have 60 or so plus clusters just to manage the control plane. So each one of these clusters has you know, the Kubernetes master and a set of workers, networking, storage, all kind of stuff around that. So they're just a how do we keep those managed, those clusters themselves up to date and managed properly? Um, and also, how do we manage the 1,500 deployments of our software across those 60 clusters? So Armada itself is made up of several different services. We have things like for the UI, for the API, deployment process, cluster process. So we have all these various different microservices, and it totals around 1,500 separate deployments just for our control plane. Uh, and on top of that, we manage upwards of 10,000 or more customer clusters. And each one of those customer clusters also has just a little bit of IBM code that runs on it as well. So now we have to manage code across tens of thousands of clusters 
Um, and uh, not only that, but our teams themselves are kind of spread across the world. IBM loves to do this. We've got so many people, we just can't do it all in one spot. So we've got folks from our team in Raleigh and Austin, the UK, Germany. Um, I know I'm missing some places, but the point is we're kind of, uh, we have this global team spread across the world. So that also adds to some of the challenges. How do we make sure that all the teams can operate um, as an uh, efficient team together? So when I started the group, uh, they had taken a lot of the old kind of practices. Um, you know, they were, they were just deploying to a single data center, so they had set up all these Jenkins jobs to set up this pipeline to push from dev to stage to pre-stage to production. And that deployment process would take around three or four hours. Um, and we also tend to treat Armada itself as just big monolith. So we'd say, okay, here's Armada 1.5.3, Let's push this whole thing from stage into production. And that actually was not scalable um, because we couldn't centrally build and push this thing out to six different places. I mean, if we, wanted, if we kept the same model, we'd probably do a release maybe once a month. Um, and on top of that, um, since we're doing these big monolithic releases, the releases themselves got very big. So you would have literally hundreds and hundreds of changes going to every single deployment. So, um, so we kind of came up with some principles and what do we want to focus on? What do we want to make better for, uh, for the container service? So the first thing we focus on visibility. And this is kind of one of the things I had learned 20 years ago doing services. That one of the most important things that we need to know is what's actually running where? When did it get it updated? Um, you know, are there any issues in the environment? So, so visibility is the first thing we tackled. Uh, so now not only do we know when we deployed something, but we know exactly what's running on every single cluster at any one time. Um, in the past, we knew what we deployed, but we didn't know it was actually running. So that was a, a really helpful. In addition to with transparency, so this is kind of an IBM overall thing with transparency. In the past, we used to have you know, the R RTC or CMBC for these code repositories, and it was kind of like, you know, it's a need-to-know basis to see the source code. So we've actually adopted this, you know, the, this traditional GitHub model where everything is open. Um, so if uh, the IBM the team that works on the UI has a question about API, they can just look at the code for, a, uh, for API. They can submit a PR for a code change. So this is all stuff that we in the room all know and love, but this is something that we had to learn over time. Um, uh, and the next thing is kind of decentralizing and decoupling um, our services. So I mentioned before, most of our services were, we kind of treat our model just one big monolithic thing. And we've learn now to decouple these services. And because we treat it as a monolith, there's like two guys in an organization of over 200 people that it could actually push out a release of Armada. And so their jobs, they hated their jobs because like every, they just spent their job, they just basically either doing deployments or figuring out how to fix a broken deployment. And so part of the decentralization was, well, let's take some of that, you know, deployment steps and building and processing uh, the actual microservice, let's push them back to the actual squads that own the code. Um, and what's interesting is when we first talked about this, there was a lot of pushback from the two guys who actually had to do the, the releases. And their, their uh, excuse was that, no, these guys don't know how to do deployment. And our response back to them was, that, well, they need to learn how to do it because you can't really support your code in an environment if you don't know how to deploy it out in the environment. So that was actually uh, one big step that we took. Um, and also decoupling. We had kind of a lot of interdependencies between our code, between our services, so they weren't really true microservices. And we're kind of about halfway through. We still have some dependencies, but we've managed to break a lot of the dependencies because this is one reason that people wanted to push this monolith because they would say, well, we've got these 25 things. We know it works in this particular configuration, um, and so we can only push in that configuration. And we actually just kind of broke that mindset. And this is more kind of just like a live and learn. We just decided one day, okay, Everyone's going to do their own deployments, um, and guess what? The actual sky didn't fall, um, and the sun still rose the next morning. So we've actually been kind of moving um, much faster and much more efficiently because of that. Uh, standardization is a big thing for us, um, which is kind of an oxymoron because I just said that we're trying to decentralize and decouple, yet we still want some standardization. So we didn't want the teams to go, truly go through and do whatever they wanted to. Um, so we set aside some standards like, you know, you have to name your deployments the same as your GitHub repo. You have to uh, use Travis CI to do builds. Um, th things like that, kind of best of practice or best of breed uh, processes and tooling is, uh, is what we focus on. It doesn't mean that just one team comes up with these processes. If another squad says, hey, we found a better way to build this thing, 
um, then we'll investigate that, and then if it and honestly works better for everyone, uh, then everyone else will pick that up. Uh, and finally, simplicity. And I don't know if it, this is an industry-wide thing or an IBM thing, but we love to make complex, over-engineered architectures. Um, so this is one thing that um, a lot of times when we do PRs for new changes to our processes and pipelines and things like that, we will actually go back and say, no, you know, it's simpler. Um, and sometimes it's actually, simplicity means no automation. Um, this is actually one of the things we learned because a lot of times you hear about this, and like, you know, automate your pipeline as much as possible. What we'd find out is that certain things like automatically promoting code from dev to stage to pre-prod into production didn't really buy us anything because it's actually easier for the developers who wrote the code to go through and click a couple of buttons to actually do the deployment. And we'll, I'll show you that a little bit on the demonstration here, but the, we've actually made the deployment so easy that we didn't really need the automation to, you know, to do the promotion through the different stages. So the RASI CI CD process kind of looks like this at a very high level. Um, and you'll notice we've got, you know, it's mostly basic stuff, Travis CI, Kubernetes, GitHub, um, one thing you're noticing here is launch darkly, and this is kind of one of the, I think, new and novel ways um, we've been using launch darkly. Uh, we actually use it to control our deployments. Uh, so we actually feature flag each component um, in our environment, and that feature flag is a multivariant flag, and we can just say, hey, I wanted to roll this particular component out to 5% you know, of the customer clusters in Dallas, or I want to roll this out to everything in the AP North region. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit here. So. One of the things we did come to the realization is that CI and CD are not the same things for us. Um, this is, I think, a problem we've tried to do in the past, tried to solve in the past, is like, how can we get CI and CD to work together seamlessly? And we just gave them, said, that we're not going to do that because we're gonna, we're gonna commit code, Travis is gonna build that into an image, um, and that's our CI process, is just building image. That kind of stops once the image is in the repositories. Um, so we just use, in you know, Jerusalem, we have stuff, we have our own uh, GitHub Enterprise service, which coincidentally is actually the largest GitHub installation besides GitHub.com itself, is GitHub.ibm.com. Uh, we use Travis CI for all of our builds. So uh, we do, you know, all of our standard uh, Docker builds and linting and code scans and uploading the images to Docker repositories or re registries um, from Travis. We have our own uh, uh, Docker repositories that we offer as IBM Cloud Service, so we upload that to there. Um, we actually have some servers that we upload to Docker Hub itself, uh, but that's still kind of frowned upon at IBM, so we, uh, we try not to do that very often. <laughs> um, and we also use IBM Cloud Object Storage to store kind of non-image stuff, like all of our configuration for our clusters is actually stored in Cloud Object Storage. And finally, once Travis is done building it and upload the images, we'll tell on directly, hey, we've got a new variant. We've got a new version of this image available. So then what happens is our CD process. Um, so on all those clusters, all the tens of thousands, uh, specifically like the 60 control plane clusters, we have something called Cluster Updater that runs on all these clusters. And what Cluster Updater's job does is it um, checks to see which particular services are running on a cluster, and any cluster, or um, then for every microservice, we will compare the version to what uh, LaunchDarkly tells us um, should be running that cluster. So, for example, our Mata API may be at, at version 111, and it may ask LaunchDarkly, hey, which version is our Mata API, and it comes back 112. Cluster operator will then basically set that new image um, on the Kubernetes cluster, and Kubernetes will do the deployment from 111 to 112. It's a little bit more, we actually don't, we use git commit hashes for everything, not actually version numbers, um, but you kind of get the point that uh, all of our deployments are actually are, launch directly is kind of our source of truth to tell uh, all of our clusters what should be running everywhere. Uh, and on top of that, any uh, configuration we have, everything that's not in an image, also comes is versioned, and the version comes from launch darkly. So launch darkly will say, "Hey, our mod, our mod is secure. You should be running version 120. Um, if 120 is not applied on that particular cluster, uh, the cluster operator will pull that down from cloud object storage and apply it to Kubernetes. So if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, um, basically everything's a everything's a resource, and we've actually chose to use the YAML representation of the resource. So Kubernetes actually does most of the hard work for us. So doing like the the rolling updates, um, managing any um, you know, changes or health checking, um, liveliness checks, things like that. Kubernetes does that for us. We basically say, hey, Kubernetes, 
go run this version of our Met API. Here's the URL to the image, um, and just let me know when you're done. So from that perspective, uh, it's, it's, uh, it actually works really well. The, um, and the finally, the last thing Cluster Updater does, it posts that information, basically the current state of the cluster, back to a service we created called Risey Dash. And that's kind of where the visibility comes into, into play here. So that's kind of how we actually deploy stuff. Uh, and so one of the other problems that we had to solve was how do we manage configuration? How do we manage the configuration of you know, 10,060 clusters? And so we actually, the the, we started specifically with the 60 clusters as part of our control plane. And what we found is that most of the data was the same across all these different regions. So we had a few things that changed, like the etcd, user ID and password and URL. Um, we had different um, tokens for OAuth and things like that. So what we did is we built this repository called Armada Secure, and at the very top of the tree is all of our general configuration. So anything that gets applied to every cluster goes at the top, and then the next level below that is per region. So if we have something specific for like AP North or US East, we'll put that configuration in that directory. Um, and then finally down to the type, so we have those carriers, spokes, cruisers, um, actually patrols, and we also have another one for RASI to run some of our infrastructure tooling. And again, at that level, that will, level will be applied um, specifically for that particular type of cluster in that particular region. So what this allows us to do is now have a single, a single project which manages the configuration for all of, our, um, all of our control plane in one place. And the cool thing about it is that any, it kind of offers like a single direction of encryption. So we make the public key per, uh, easily accessible for any member of the organization. So anyone can take data, encrypt it using that GPG key, check it into the project, um, and then during our build process, we actually decrypt that. We will encrypt it uh, for each cluster. So every single control cluster has its own public private key pair. And when data is pushed or pulled actually to these clusters, only that cluster can decrypt data for its own uh, particular use. So that's actually how we manage the configuration of all the uh, elements. And it's actually been really cool to see this actually grow because, again, we started where everyone had their own configuration. Like Armada API had their own configuration, Armada UI, and uh, like 85% of the stuff was the same. Getting everyone kind of meshed together into the single project was, yes, it was a bit of a hassle. Um, and we had a lot of confusion around what was happening. But at the end of the day, ev everyone's been super happy about it. Um, and they've been finding that just managing the configuration itself has been much, much easier. So that's my spiel, my pitch. Um, I'm going to jump real quick to kind of show you what the tooling actually looks like. Uh, so let me make sure I can get this to work here. So let me end the show. And. Doo -doo -doo. OK, so let's start actually with Rise Dash. Um, so this is an application that we wrote, and this is kind of solves our visibility problem. So again, every one of the clusters, every you know, all the 10,060 clusters, every 60 seconds, they report back information about what's running in the environment. So from that, uh, we can see here um, that there's, of course, I lied. Is there's, it's not 10,000 yet because we're actually in the process of rolling out to these 10,000 clusters. So we have 2,700 clusters right now that's reporting, um, and out of those, there's 37,000 deployments. Uh, we can also track things like as the deployments change over time. So since we've got all this information and we collect every 60 seconds, we can now do things like not only what's currently running, but we can tell when things change. We actually record when things change as well. Uh, we can see recent deployments, uh, which cluster, um, the name of the uh, project or the name of the, um, the deployment, and when it was updated. So one of the things we can also do is we can go to the clusters and we can do a search. Uh, so we can do like a you know, prod dash uh, carrier. So these are all our production carriers um, that we have running the environment. Um, and if I pick any one of these, I can see that this particular cluster is running all of these services. So they're in our Armada namespace itself, we have like 20 or so different services. We have things running the Coop system namespace. Um, and since we kind of talked about standardization, since we standardize on GitHub commit hash for all of our image tagging, we're now able to quickly see the version of you know, the microservice itself, the version that's running, the version that launched directly says it should be running, and when it got changed. So if I click here when it got changed, we can see that you know, they went from this version to the version nine days ago. Um, two months ago, they'd updated this. This is obviously one of microservices that doesn't change as often. Uh, but if we go to something like Armada UI, they should actually be changing more frequently. So you can see two days, 12 days ago, 14 days ago. Um, so my excuse for the limited amount of deployments, because for a while, Armada UI was pushing out code almost once a day. We're kind of in the middle of this GDPR 
um, compliance um, shindig right now. So that's actually slowed us down a bit, but we do have this history here. Um, and since it's all revolves around GitHub, like I can click on this link right here, and it'll tell me, basically bring me to the chain set that went into that particular um, version of the code that's running. So this provides us the, uh, the visibility into what's running on a particular cluster. I also have different views I can look at across for deployments. So in this case, here's the Razidash application. You can see that's actually deployed to two different clusters here. If I click on uh, the deployment name itself, we can see a little bit more information um, where it's deployed. Uh, in this case, it's only running in two clusters. Um, and also the rules, the deployment rules themselves. Now these deployment rules just mirror what's already in LaunchDarkly. So we're using LaunchDarkly as a source of truth. Um, the cool thing about LaunchDarkly is that you can set up these really cool rules that say, you know, you know, if it's, if it's Wednesday and you're in Dallas and the sun is shining, then roll out this version. So obviously we're not going to go that crazy with it. But what we usually say is that, you know, if your region is this, uh, AP North, you're going to get this version. If your region or if your cluster name starts with dev dash, then you get this other version. Um, and what we've done here is we've exposed just the rules um, and the version that is associated with those rules through Rise Dash. And the one reason we did this is we wanted to tie all the access controls um, to who can actually set these deployments to people who have right access to the GitHub repos. So the Rise Dash application itself, when I signed in, I signed in using the standard OAuth mechanism built into GitHub. And because of that, uh, now I know, Rise Dash now knows which organizations I belong to and which repos I have access to. So what happens now is that it knows that, hey, I've, this is my uh, GitHub repo URL it knows that I have write access to this and it'll actually allow me to change the rules. If I only had read access, if I didn't have access to it, it wouldn't allow me to change these rules. So that's actually how we typically do deployments. Um, and we also audit all of our changes through here. So if I look on our profile, actually if I go to audit log, we can see um, you know, everything that changed um, throughout, um, throughout uh, Rise of here. So we can see things like you know, did when they changed the rules or when they archive clusters and stuff like this. It's all audited through here. So that's how we kind of view what's running. Um, we're actually kind of coming up with new ways that we can kind of mine this data to see um, how we can make our development process better um, and more efficient. And finally, um, so this is LaunchDarkly. Um, so LaunchDarkly is actually what does the magic for us, which allows us to manage these thousands of deployments across um, uh, many, many clusters. So for every service that we have, we have a microservice. I mean, we have a feature flag. So in this case, I'm going to pick on um, I'm going to pick on Armada Billing because they actually do things the right way. And so Armada Billing has a set of rules, and we'll scroll in here. Um, so for every rule that you'll see, for example, we have a rule that says if the cluster name starts with Dev, you know, roll out this version, or if the cluster name is you know Stage of South, roll out this version. And the cool thing about this is that um, since everything is decentralized and we don't have like a central Jenkins server or central deployment server pushing code out, we could theoretically push out new code to every single one of our clusters within 60 seconds because each of these cluster operators is running independently and they're, every 60 seconds they're checking for updates. So if we wanted to, we could actually push out new code within 60 seconds to every single one of our um, clusters. So we could uh, update you know, 1,500 deployments all at once. Should we? No. Could we? Yes. Uh, but um, what we've chose instead is kind of, and this is kind of what we settled on, is that we'll roll out by region. So <laughs> we'll actually pick on the Australians first. We'll roll out stuff to Sydney, make sure it doesn't break there first. That's kind of our canary test. Uh, so we'll roll out stuff to Sydney, make sure nothing breaks. Uh, and of course, this is after we've already gone to our existing stage environment. But what we do find is that, you know, there's no place like production home to test stuff in. <laughs> because we'll put stuff to the stage, it works great. Um, we'll put it into pre product it works great. And we'll push out of production, and bam, you know, oh, we forgot about this or did this. Um, so what this allows us to do is to just easily, we test stuff in Sydney. Um, the cool thing about the process here is it doesn't really, we can go either way. So we can go forward or backward releases. So in this case, we're here on, you know, for example, on dev, they're running version 717 in dev. If I don't go back to 712, I'll just click save here. Um, and within 60 seconds, um, this new version will be running for Armada. Actually, I can't remember Armada billing, right? So I can see Armada billing, and that was on and dev. So 
So we should see here. So here's our Mata billing running on dev south. I think it's carrier five. Um, and then hopefully what we should see here, actually I can't remember which carrier it's on. Um, what you'll see here quickly is that one of these will actually get flat updated um, to like a few seconds ago. So that's actually how we, that's how we do our deploys, so is just going through changing the feature flag and having that rolled out. And then, uh, and it's kind of up to the squads themselves. We kind of talked about the squad autonomy and letting them do their own thing. Um, it's really up to the squads how they actually want to roll the code out. We, again, we're kind of setting best practices. Let's do it by region. Um, let's automatically push out the dev when the stuff is built. So we kind of, kind of uh, built into the feature flags themselves. I mean, into the rule sets themselves. And the cool thing about, I don't know if you noticed, when I drop this down, so the variations themselves are generated from Travis. So when Travis is done building the code, it will actually create the variation. And the variation contains not only GitHub commit hash, but also contains the Travis build number. So you have some sort of sequence in here. Um, but also it has the uh, GitHub pull request message. So we can have some human um, or some English text to say well, actually what went into the change. So that is how we build, and that's how we deploy. And uh, with that, um, <laughs> thanks for listening.